Um, I want to introduce to you Anne Warren for this um, month's demo. Um, she moved here from the east in, uh, to Oregon in 2019, and she uses unusual techniques. She um, adds um, plant, uh, natural plants to her printings of some of her work, and she's going to probably demo on that today. And um, she's got nature prints, and she uses watercolor and acrylic um, on her techniques. So um, here's Anne. Take over. <laughs> Thank you. I met Rita a couple months ago, and she said, oh, you could come and do a demo for us. And I said, I don't think so. <laughs> and then she kept after me. And I, I know how hard it is to get people to come and do demos. So I finally said yes. And it's been a great thing for me. If you can't hear me, let me know. She's because I have hearing aids in my head, but I don't know how loud I am. So. I, what I'm going to do is ask how many of you are water soluble painters. Okay, that's a majority of people. What I what I'm going to do today is go through my life as an artist really quickly, and I want you to think how it relates to you. And at the end of the presentation, you can ask any kind of questions you want. I started out as a two-year-old with my aunt. And we, we lived in the East Coast this whole time. And she said to me, we're going to walk out in the field, and I don't want you to look. I want you to see. And that somehow has stuck in my mind all these years. There's a difference between looking and seeing. So as an artist, I think we all want to see things because we're going to project them to some other place. I think right now, too, considering that it's fall, the colors are just dynamic. When the sun comes out, especially for... The leaves on the trees are so, and if you, you know, are a little bit of an artist, you really, like you said, see it so much clearer than somebody who isn't an artist. So I'm going to start with all this stuff and show you how I have used it because I'm not a regular artist, I think, outside the box. So I, if you look at a whole lot of my things. I've been doing watercolor for a long time. But I want to start out with my Aunt Emily walking through these fields. And then I had a grandson who went to nursery school. And he came home with this, four years old. And when I had this hanging in my house, and people came through to see what I had for sale. They wanted this. They didn't want what I did. They wanted what Henry did at four years old. And we've had um, artists' works on the wall, the sky wall, in Willamette View. And the one that gets the most um, comments are the ones the kids did. <laughs> but at four years old, that's pretty good. <clears throat> the other thing I thought about when I was growing up, we had a radiator in the bathroom. And that's what colored crayons were used for. You put them on the radiator when it was hot and it drizzled down and then you took them out and put it someplace else. I don't have any of those. I didn't keep them. But that was one of the things. And you know yourself, some crayons have more color in them than others. But if you put them on the radiator, you can blend them all up and then put them on the 
I wasn't popular. <laughs> but what a beautiful radiator. <laughs> and they don't have radiators anymore. But you could do it with a steam kettle. Okay, I'm going to start down here. This is what happens to, this is a foam core piece. And when you paint on one side, it kind of makes its own strange design. So in order to make this flat, you put it down on the, on the floor and paint it with water. And then put rocks on top. And it's always good to have some nice flat rocks. So every place I've ever lived, I bring rocks home. And these, if you put on two corners, and I have many more, I can put it down so that it will dry flat. And if that happens, this was all kind of, I used it in back as a backing. But you can see it's flat now because I had it, rocks on it one night and it was... So if you have a problem with your paper and your watercolorist, you want it flat. So you do both sides of the paper before you start putting paint on it and it will lie flat. The other thing that happened when I was a kid, was the fact that um, I like to try things. So this, this was a can of black paint and maple leaves. And I sprayed them, I put the seeds down and I put these down and they came out, out black. These were white underneath. And then I could put the colors on the maple leaves that were. And this has been a very popular piece of artwork that um, people didn't think I did anything like this. But it, I like to look out, take something that I really like and fiddle with it, like the crayons and like the maple leaves. <coughs> then with, I didn't, for a long time, I didn't do any art. You know, life got in the way. Had three children. And there was a doctor in Hanover, New Hampshire, where we lived, and Stephen was born. He said to me, you have to make time for yourself. You have to do something that either you want to do or that you know how to do. But you have to take that time, get somebody to take care of the kids, your husband if he's home, which he wasn't very often because he was a doctor and an intern, at the hospital and so I began in a clay class in Hanover, New Hampshire and I looked forward to that you know every every <coughs> week it came around it was actually twice a week I believe and um, but it got me out of in a whole different venue so think about that as, as we get older, it's more important probably than it was for me to get out with a little baby and a two-year-old. One of the ways I did that was to take a class. And it was advertised in our local paper in Delmar, New York, which is near Albany. You have to be very careful when you move to Oregon because there's an Albany down the road. <laughs> and my daughter who lives here 
said, you know, Mom, everybody always looks at me like I'm crazy when I say I came from Dillon, from Albany, because I don't say New York. <laughs> so she now says New York. <laughs> but I had This was a, pic, a photograph that I took of my garden, and I have those big orange poppies. And uh, so we had, there were five of us in a class, the teacher and four students, and that was my first formal lesson. And Colleen, I worked with her once a week for two years, except when school vacation was out. And we f I found out two things. One, she said she would like to have us each bring something that we would like to paint. And then we had to give, make a copy of it and each one of us would paint for the week one of the, one of the five pictures that we had given out. So this was the picture that I chose for everybody to paint. And this is one of the ones that somebody else gave us to paint. And after, after we got finished with it, we had a show. And we knew we were going to have a show at a, an old folks home. And they had a big long wall like this. So each, each painting that, that each one of us did had five copies. So there were five copies of this hung on the wall. And I had to paint this one too. So my painting of the poppies was part of it. But they had five, the teacher did one and the five of four of us, and they were hung together in a space about this big. But there were five spaces of five pictures. And do you think we did good work we really did because we wanted to have the best that we had learned up on that wall. And it was up for a couple of months. And it, so it made a lot of people very happy who got to see it every day. Mm -hmm. And it made us happier because they wanted to look at it. <laughs> so that's a good way to, to think about something if you belong to a group to have everybody painting the same picture because you know it can't happen. It, it, it won't look like any, all five of them will look different. Mm -hmm. I have some things. The cards that I made I brought because my pictures, a lot of them are big, and I only brought a very few things to Oregon because I thought, oh, I'll have lots of time. <laughs> you know, I can paint, paint a lot of things. I can go to a lot of classes. And that, that's true, but it didn't happen because in between times, I joined an international group of nature printers. There are about 350 of us now. When I joined in 03, there were probably half that many, maybe 100 people. And every other year, they had a, a, a weeks-long workshop in, on the east, east Coast, and then the next year, it would be on the West Coast and everybody was signed up right after Christmas because they wanted to be sure to get on the list. But that was mostly nature things that were printed. 
and I put these over here. Because when you go out now, there's all kinds of major stuff that you can pick up, like these ginkgo leaves. And I can use them in a picture. And I decided I wanted to have a chop. You know what chop is? Mm -hmm. How many have one? <laughs> I thought I could have one too, but I never could get it to, to this little block of material. You could put a very thin knife in and carve your initial in it. I tried twice and it didn't work. But you know what worked really well? <laughs> with a corn cob. Ah. So I have corn cobs that I cut at different places in the, in the cob after the corn was eaten. And I have a really great chop. So it's, I can use these, paint them around the corner, and just put my initials in it when I get finished. <laughs> And it's a chop, so you... What's a chop? Oh, when you get your picture painted, mm -hmm. you paint around, I paint around the outside of this, or if you had a regular chop, you put paint on the mm -hmm. surface, and then you put it in the corner of your picture, or your shirt, or whatever you're painting. And it's your, your sign. Stamp. It's a stamp. It's an, it's an, uh, oh, an Asian art. Yeah. That's, they typically have a chop, the artist. And it'll be yeah. unique to that person. Yeah, it was done in Japan. And if you see, look at Japanese mm -hmm. paintings or bot prints or anything that came from the Orient, everyone has mm -hmm. something in the corner somewhere that designates the artist. It's usually red, And it's too. called a chop. She was a great, when I went to uh, China, I got a shop that says the chemist. Of course, I can't read it because it's in Chinese, but it has a little inky <laughs> touch, touch your when it's white. Oh, okay. Does that makes sense. It's like a signature. Yeah, it's a signature. It's a logo. So you use that as a signature. And so that, yes, that yeah. suits me that just fine because if I have a piece of corn, that's my day. So, one of the things I've found lately, when you're walking around and you're looking at the ground and you see nuts on the ground, they're walnuts and they're um, Chinese chestnuts. Mm -hmm. And if you take those and stamp on them, especially the walnuts, black walnuts mm -hmm. make a stain. Mm -hmm. And you can take it home. And unfortunately, I never wear gloves, so my hands always look like I've been out in the, in the dirt. But if you step on those walnuts and take off the skin, the husk, that's still green. You can rub this on a piece of paper or on the wood that you've niched and you will get a stain that you could buy in the grocery store or the hardware store and you've got it just from the, there are lots of them on the ground right now. I don't suggest you uh, put your hands on the next one yet. <laughs> Then the other thing I do is try to make things easier for myself. And I didn't bring it with me, but I have a painting of roses that my partner had given me for Valentine's Day. And I got up in the middle of the night and the, the vase of a dozen roses were in 
the window of the condo that we lived in. And as I looked at it with the black of the outside, I thought, this is what I'm going to paint. This is the way I'll finish it off. So I painted the um, window sill that was lighted on the inside and the black that was behind it. And it won a big prize. For me, it was wonderful. But um, the re reason I'm telling you this is because it had baby's breath in it. And you know how baby's breath, if you're doing something on white paper, you have to leave it white mm -hmm. to make the, make the baby's breath. And it takes a lot of effort and time to paint all those little blobs on your painting. So I devised a way to make it easy, but not for that picture. But this is, this is something that has twofold. Um, I put some snow on this side, and I'm going to show you how I did it. And this is, has not been wet wetted and and put down on the floor so that it's flat. So you never could frame this the way it is. And it's very dis discouraging when you have something that's just right and it looks like this when you get finished. <laughs> you know. Because you can't frame it. You can't do anything with it unless you put water on it and make it flat. So I had to make something flat. So again, I went to the garden. And all these things that I stuck in here have pieces on the ends that I can use as a brush. And they're messy. So I usually have something on the floor. What, what you do is you take your paint, whatever color you want it, and instead of taking a brush and meticulously painting each one of those little baby's breath, you put your white paint, which this is um, titanium white, and you take a piece of it, and you can do different sizes. Right now, everything's blooming, but I had to pick this yesterday because if it's dark, it won't, if it, it will come out and be all over the place and in your paint. So, for this, these are the baby's breath that have gone to seed. So I just take a piece of them and plop them in the white paint see the little bitty things on there? And you can do this with almost anything. I do it a lot with sponges. Get a sponge and wet, sponge a sponge wet, and then paint backgrounds. Or take, if you want a sky, you can put a color on, over the white paper and then blow it with a, a just a regular um, straw. <clears throat> well, you know, all of you know what a straw looks like. <clears throat> yes. And you can blow that and be sure you get shadow. Because when you do it, the, your paint will go together or spread out in ways that look like the clouds. And you can't paint them that way, at least I never could. But it really works well the other way. Okay, I'm going to dab this in my white paint. <coughs> See, it has a lot of little white specks on it. 
so my baby's breath has a new life. And then I can just paint it up there. And it looks like snow or baby's breath or whatever you want it to be. I'm going to put this down because it'll. And you can make this any color. And you can do it with sponges to make other things. Grass is wonderful with sponge. And I have a variety of sponges. Just little fuzzy things. A big sponge that is bigger. But this you can wet. You wet things first and then dab it in your white paint. And then you can put it on anything. Different colors, messes. <laughs> but that's what I did with this. And it just came out nice and blue over the black. I don't usually paint over the black unless it's white. My granddaughter made me this bag 10 years ago. She did the sewing and I did the printing. And these are, they call them um, purses. The skate laces eggs in these on the East Coast. I didn't find any on the West Coast. You do have some in here? Yes, it's an egg. Yeah, it's an egg case for a skate. Yeah. And, um, but they make really nice things on bags, and I've washed this 10 times at least, and it's still there. So one of the things when I say, say I washed it, it's very, I have learned a very important lesson that you should all follow, and that is test everything first before you put it on a piece of paper. So you have some paper next to your paints and you try it out. The first thing I ever made um, as a nature printer was done a black shirt on white. And I spent all day working at it and it was beautiful and I washed it and it all washed away. <laughs> That was a very good lesson well learned because I test everything, everything that I use with watercolor to make sure that it's the right color to go next to something else. I do it on paper or whatever the, the material is that I'm using. And if, if you do that, you won't be disappointed because you spend too much time one, thinking about what you're going to do, and then doing it to have it ruined. So I'm just going to go through really quickly about all the kinds of things I use and what I use them for. Hemp is great. You just get a piece of it, unravel it, and you can use it as a brush or whatever. This is one of those things that goes around a coffee cup so you will burn your hand. <laughs> Makes it great. Anything that has leaves, in it. you can put, it can be a fence. You paint it and press it to the whatever, the watercolor that you've got on your paper. You can have painted it and if it's still wet, you can press this down on that and have a fence. Or you can have a funny looking barks for trees, you know, because you can make them as big as you need to.
time I find a different kind of sponge, I get a piece of it. So I've got flat ones and I've got um, perforated ones. <clears throat> and then I've got a variety of, of I left all my good paint, painting uh, brushes home because I don't use them usually because I use a lot of things with bleach in it and the bleach just eats these all up. So it's very important to get everything pretty well cleaned up after you're using your watercolor brushes too. What's the bleach for? I'm sorry? What's the bleach for? What's the bleach for? Oh, the bleach is what I'll talk about next. <laughs> what, what the bleach was for is what I've learned to do since 19... Hundred or twenty, twenty thousand, twenty, whatever that was, way back years ago, twenty-three years ago, I joined a group of international nature printers, and nature printers print fish the way the Japanese did fish. The English apothecaries made um, prints of the things that made the pills and potions that they sold, and they had the people didn't read the names, but they recognized a poison ivy leaf or a poison oak leaf, and these were all in their apothecary shop so that they could come and point to them and get a bottle of this or a, some salve of that. So, I have all these things that I use. Um, and there are two ways to, to make prints. I'm sure there are a lot more than that. But one is to use soft scrub with bleach and to bleach out the color of a cotton shirt. It doesn't work to have it any other kind of, um, be, uh, things can't be made of things that are plastic. So, um, and then I have little good brushes to do kind of beautiful things. I don't do those beautiful things. Everything I do now is something that I print, and it's something natural. So, somebody wanted to buy my beautiful apron, and I, I said I wouldn't sell it for any price. And I've been wearing it since 2002. <laughs> So again, it isn't done yet. <laughs> <laughs> There's one other thing that's really helpful. If you do any matting at all and you have points in your picture, this little plastic knife or a credit card that you don't use anymore will go slip under those points and lift them right out. Mm -hmm. And you can do these, this pay, painting and three minutes just going through and putting this under the back. You put it under like this. Of course it won't work when I want it to. Well anyway, it really works <laughs> here. It just goes underneath and then the, your point will come right out. It saves you hours and fingers. This is what you were bombed for. 
and, and uh, credit card works just as well because you have a big surface and you put it under it, lift it up, and then they're, they're done. The other thing I do now is um, at Willamette, Willamette View, we have a store. And we have a lot of frames in the store. Some of them, this wasn't one of them, but um, some of them come um, with mats. So if I'm going to paint something and I know about what size it is, I, I take the, the, whatever the material is that I'm going to frame down there before I put it, put the paint in the, on the thing that's going to be framed and get a frame for it. Because I can buy a frame there with glass or sometimes with a mat for very little money. And because don't we all have pictures in our houses? Mm -hmm. So many that you're falling over them, probably. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. it, makes, it makes a difference. You can go to Michael's and buy a frame before you do your pictures so you know they're going to fit. Because if you do them, if you get anything that's made for that picture at a place like Michael's or any kind of the frame shops, they're very expensive. <coughs> and unfortunately, if you're like my family, they have enough of my work. <laughs> and it's hard, it's hard to get rid of it. But if it doesn't cost you much, it doesn't matter. You paint what you want to paint. <laughs> So that's my spiel. There's a lot of things can, can that I've done up, here. Can you hold up all those cards, one by one there, card? your cards, your samples, to um, show us? Yeah. 